Right, I'm in the workshop again today, and today I wanted to do a video about box turning. Uh, I make a lot of lidded boxes, uh, hybrid lidded boxes, wood lidded boxes, and uh, I get asked a lot of questions, how's it done, um, how, how do you start, how do you hold it, um, and I think the subject's a bit too big to put it all into one video, um, so I'm, I'm going to break it down into sections, and the first section really that, that uh, is the most important one is rough turning and um, I think most people are familiar with it with bowls where they where they can rough turn a bowl leave it to season for a year rematch it on the lathe and finish turning it but not many people uh, are, are as familiar with it with box turning um, and it's important sometimes you'll hear people say it's only other wood turners that care about the fit of the lid um, and, and it's not. Uh, I've got collectors from all over the world that buy my boxes and normally the first thing they comment on is, is the fit of the lid uh, and how accurate it is. Um, so to have an accurate fitting lid and for it to stay accurately fitting uh, the wood must be seasoned and, and that is seasoned to the relative humidity to where it's eventually going to live. So in my workshop here in, in England, um, if I wanted the box to stay out here in the workshop, I can take a piece of wood off the rack, turn it, finish it, leave it out here, and that would stay a perfectly fitting lid. If I want to then take that box into the house, that lid over the next few days uh, will, will stay a perfect fit where the grain lines up, but then when you turn it 90 degrees it will go tight, and then turn it another 90 degrees, it will go back to the perfect fit. And that's because basically the, the box has gone slightly oval, ever so, ever so slightly, but that's enough to make the lid uh, no longer a perfect fit. Um, so I rough them out, um, and then I, I write the date on them, take them into the house, leave them in a cupboard in the house, and depending on what wood it is, I can leave them for six months, 12 months, several years. I tend to have a stockpile of them in the house and when I'm in the box making mood go pick out a few of my favourites and sometimes it's nice because you forget about woods that you've had and you, oh, and you can't remember roughing it out and so um, you know you, you, you sort of take what you want, bring them into the workshop, make the box and then take it straight back into the house. If you left the box in the workshop overnight, well in my workshop, again it would it would uh, pick up uh, moisture uh, from the atmosphere uh, and you would have ruined all your hard work from, and patience from leaving it in the house. Um, so unless you're lucky enough to have a, a centrally heated climate controlled workshop, which I don't think many of us have, then rough turning, uh, you have to do it really. It's an essential step and I'm going to show you how, how I do that today. Um, the only time you don't really need to rough turn is if the wood's stabilised, or like with my hybrid uh, part resin, part burr boxes, the burr before it's cast with the resin has already been dried to a very low moisture content, uh, and as long as those blanks are then stored in the house, you, you don't need to rough those out. You can go from blank to finished box in one session. And I think that will be the final video that I do. I think I'm going to have a roughing out video a normal wooden box video and then a hybrid video uh, and sort of it'll step up showing the different techniques but it'll also show that a lot of the techniques how you hold it how you turn it round are exactly the same so so that's what I'm, I'm going to do today and uh, I hope you enjoy right here are uh, some of the roughed out boxes that I've brought into the workshop uh, from the house um, and this is just to show you uh, what, what I, I, how I do it. This is the, the end product uh, of what, what I'm going to do today. This is a piece of laburnum. Uh, this was, I always uh, take them together and, uh, and write the date on them and sometimes I write the wood, it depends whether I know it or not. Um, but this is laburnum and this was, I don't know if the camera will pick this up, but this was roughed out on the 16th of the 10th of 2009. So this is well and truly dry and ready by now. Um, but I've had boxes in the cupboard, I think going back to 2003 was my oldest one. So 
Uh, this just shows uh, the amount of, of material I take out in the middle. Um, when I first started roughing out, I would take a lot more material out. Um, and obviously that quickens the process because there's less wood to dry. Um, but it does then restrict you on what type of um, design of the box that you, that you can make from it because obviously you've got a smaller wall thickness. So it might be that right now you've got a particular favourite shape and, and you could rough out dozens of boxes all to those proportions. But in three or four years time when you come to work with them you, that shape might not still be your favourite shape and uh, and so you've restricted yourself um, and, and, and potentially wasted some material. So I tend to just, nowadays, I, I, and this was strange in 2009 that I did it like this, but I tend to just take a small amount, just about enough to get my little finger in, uh, uh, and that's just enough really to relieve uh, some of the tension from the middle of the wood and to allow the air to get around in, into the middle. Uh, that's laburnum. Uh, this is African blackwood. African blackwood uh, is a tricky one. I love working with it and making boxes from it but it's so heavy and dense, it, it takes so long to season. Um, this was uh, January 2014, so th this this is nowhere near ready um, because it's so dense. Um, so you have to take that into consideration as well. Um, something like the burn or more ash or oak or beech will, will season a lot faster than something so heavy, dense and oily, like African blackwood, cocobolo, lignum vitae, that sort of thing. Um, and these can be all different shapes and sizes. Uh, this is, um, I was lucky enough to get some Burr London Plain, um, and this was in May 2015 this year, um, and that's drying really well. Um, and then sometimes this is a piece of uh, Lignum vitae, which is from a crown green bowling ball. Um, these balls were already a hundred years old, um, so I assumed, you know, that they would be very stable already, um, and they are. That they are they are pretty good, but uh, if you if you if you do make a box, the lid will still move slightly. So sometimes I just take uh, a round blank like that. Uh, and put it in the house again and forget about it for a few years uh, and even something heavy and, and oily like lignum vitae will also season and, and stabilise in the house eventually. Uh, it's just a matter of patience and having a stockpile of blanks so that you can every time you make a few boxes rough out a few blanks at the same time and so you've always got some in hand um, and, and it's it's a, an ongoing process. Uh, the only thing, uh, the only advantage of leaving them like this is that it doesn't restrict your proportions of uh, lid to base. That's the only downside of, of this method. Um, you have to part through, so you have to choose your lid and base proportions when you rough out. Um, but generally, um, a third to two thirds, or two fifths to three fifths, or half and half, they're the sort of the three most common proportions. And as long as you don't hollow too deeply, you've also then got a little bit of play in the thickness at, at the bottom of the blank. So, but that's the only downside with, with roughing out, uh, that the proportions are already set out. So I've mounted a, a, a piece of ash uh, between centres uh, with a four prong drive and a live centre. Um, it's a piece that I've, I've dried myself. Um, I think it was from uh, uh, the side of a large crotch, and I don't know whether the camera can pick it up, but you can see there's some sort of uh, ripple, sort of quilted figuring in it, um, which is why I kept it, uh, which is, it's quite nice. So uh, I'm just going to rough this down. Um, this is a, a spindle blank, which means that, as you can see, the grain is, is running uh, parallel to the floor. Uh, it would be parallel to the lathe bed but I haven't got a lathe bed. So that the grain is, is left to right, end grain on each end, so you can use uh, a, a spindle roughing blank uh, to knock the corners off and get it down to the round. Uh, do not use this on uh, cross grain uh, bowl turning techniques. 
um, anything where the grain is at 90 degrees to the lathe. Um, it's not designed for that. But this is a spindle blank, so it's fine. So I'm going to knock this down into the round and put a tenon on one end for my chuck. Um, and, and then we'll, we'll stop and talk about the next stage. Just stop and move the tool rest in a little closer. Um, it's not good to have too much of a large overhang. It doesn't have to be perfectly round at this stage, uh, just so it's the majority of the way there. Uh, and you can stop now, uh, look at the blank, uh, see if there's any cracks or any problems that you want to avoid in your box. Um, this piece is, is perfect all the way along. So I'm going to cut a tenon for my, to suit my uh, chuck uh, and then uh, take it out from between centres uh, and do the next stage. I'm going to cut, cut the tenon uh, with a half inch skew, but I'm going to use it flat on the rest like a scraper. Um, and, uh, and all I've done is I've, I've ground underneath, which has raised a burr on this, this top edge. So it's a negative rake scraper in effect. And I, and I just push in and cut my tenon. I suddenly realised where the camera was, you, you couldn't see uh, what I was doing at this end of the headstock. So, um, I, I'm just cutting a, a dovetail tenon on this end uh, with, with a, a, a skewed scraper held flat on the rest. With the blank now removed from between centres, I just wanted to mention uh, something about chucks. Um, all chuck jewels will have um, a size where they are at their most concentric, where, they're at the, where they form a perfect circle. And that will vary from, uh, from different manufacturers, different chucks, different jaws. Um, but if you want the best grit the best contact from your jaws onto the onto the tenon you want to you, you want the jaws so that they're at their most concentric so you can see when the jaws are fully shut exaggerated uh, that they're not a perfect circle and and to the other extreme where they're they're too far open that only the corners would be biting in and also you you've got the slide sticking out the, the body of the of the chuck which isn't safe so normally uh, there's an area where where the 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 sweet spot, so to speak, where they're very good. Uh, this is an Axminster chuck with o O'Donnell jaws, um, and this is somewhere between 50 and 55 mil where the sweet spot is. Um, so I'm just going to put the the and just push with your thumb in the middle on, up from up from the far end uh, as you tighten up the blank and. Uh, and that's now ready uh, to do the next stage. Um, this blank, I think I might get um, two boxes from it. Um, I think it's too long for one box. Um, and 
and not not really wide enough in proportion. So if I just measure the length, it's it's 150 mil or six inch. So if I half that to 75, what I'll do is I'll cut another 10 on this end, uh, which I can then hold and, and do the same again. Uh, and then I'll what I'll, I'll do is I'll mark out for a third and two thirds. So if I mark out um, roughly 25 mil, uh, which will be the lid, uh, and then the base here, and, uh, and and that will be the box. So we'll part the waste off, well, we'll, we'll scrap this end, put the tenon on, then part, part it through in the middle. Again, just using a skewed scraper and uh, sharpen underneath so it raises a burr, so it's a, it's a negative rate scraper. Just check that, but that's yeah, that's about right. Fifty-one mil. So. With a narrow parting tool, you could use a standard diamond parting tool, but with a narrow parting tool, I'm just going to uh, cut blank in half. This is a bit blunt. So going so far, and then make a slight relief where you move slightly to one side or the other to widen the cut. Now if you want to you could have parted that off and, and uh, tried to catch the blank but you don't have to do it that way, and just to show you another way is just to put a, a fine tooth saw in. And just finish it like that. So you, you now have two blanks for two boxes, but we'll, we'll concentrate on this one. Um, so all we're going to do now is, is form uh, a tenon on this end, and then part it through for the lid and the base. Now with some box designs, I don't actually hollow the lid at all, and, and to be honest, when they're this shallow, 25 mil an inch, it, I don't think it's really necessary. But some designs, you don't, I don't actually have a hollow lid inside, I have a flat lid with a finial on the top. Um, but just to, to show you how to do it, um, we'll, we'll do a, a slight hollow, because every bit that you can take out will quicken the process and help a little bit. Uh, now there's two ways you can, well there's more than two ways, but the two ways I use, you can use a, a spindle blank or you can use a, a, a scraper, but you have to uh, really, because you're only roughing out, you, you're not interested in finesse or, or any sort of finish, you just want to take that waste out and get on with a, a, a normal project or a finished project. So, 
So I'll just do it with a spindle blank, a uh, spindle gouge, sorry. It's a very simple technique. Uh, put it into the centre and with the flute 45 degrees uh, over, over to my my left, so if it was a clock face, it would be sort of 10 o'clock over this this way. Push in, and then just pivot round with the handle. So it's in, and round. And that's it. That's enough, really, to rough the lid out. So I put the base back in now. And do a similar thing with the base. You can, with the lathe stopped, you can uh, put the spindle gouge in, put your thumb there, hold it on the outside, see how deep you are. Like I say, sometimes you don't want to go too deep because it then restricts future designs a little bit. Uh, it's a little bit deeper with this one. And that's it, that's the box roughed out uh, and ready to go into the house. So what I would do is I would put the two halves uh, back to back or, or tenon to tenon, uh, put some tape around the middle, write the date on and that's it, ready for another day. Um, so uh, that's how I rough out boxes um, and that is the first and I think the most important step to good box making. So I hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, please subscribe. Thank you.